Well, we want now to turn to the philosophy of David Hume. Hume was also a so-called British empiricist, just like John Locke. And there is a, a number of connections between Hume's philosophy, especially Hume's theory of knowledge, and the theory of knowledge that John Locke gives us. I want to say something about those before showing what kind of impact they have on his view of, of uh, human nature and uh, what we can know uh, concerning human life, the afterlife, and things like that. So Hume agrees with Locke that all of our ideas come by way of sense perception. Okay? You're not born with any innate knowledge, innate concepts, innate ideas. Rather, everything that you know, um, every thought you're capable of formulating even, has to find its genesis or origin in the five external senses or on what he calls reflection, which is the ability of the mind to introspect upon its own contents. Right? So you look inside and you see beliefs, desires, sensations, emotions, and you acquire experiential ideas of those things as well, even though those things don't come to you through <clears throat> the five senses. Okay, so, so far forth, Locke and, and Hume are quite similar. It, it's easy, though, to think that Hume is a little bit more consistent than Locke is when it comes to the philosophical and methodological implications of this stance concerning uh, human knowledge. So what I mean by that is, remember that for Locke, you know, all you're aware of is the sensible, the external sensible qualities of items in your experience. You don't have any experience, nor could you have an experience, of an underlying substance or substratum underneath those or supporting uh, those sensible uh, properties. At the same time, Locke retains the traditional, the classical, so-called substance attribute ontology. So even though he doesn't have a clear idea of what a substance is, whether material or spiritual, he can't think that all there is in the world is just a bundle of, say, events or a bundle of qualities floating around. Rather, any quality that we perceive has got to inhere, has got to be supported by sub substance or other. What, what is this substance? What's it like? If you ask Locke, he says, it's something I know not what. He doesn't have an answer to that. Well, Hume says, look, let's trace this out uh, to its logical conclusions. You know, if, if you don't even have an idea of something, then when you try to name it, speak of it, describe it, or use it in your philosophy, you are quite literally saying things that don't have any meaning. You're making sound without sense. Uh, you literally don't know what you're talking about. And so what use could a notion that is meaningless or contentless actually have in your philosophy or in your science? And indeed, um, Hume says, look, when, when I introspect, when I look inside and view the, the uh, contents of my own mind, I do see things like beliefs. I do see things like hopes, desires, propositional attitudes. I see emotions and feelings aplenty. What I don't see in there is some self or soul. And, and because of this, he develops the view that human beings are merely bundles of physical and psychological events going forward in time. In other words, this is something like a Western rediscovery of the Buddha's view that human beings are bundles of mental and physical aggregates. Now, because of this, uh, there's a definite skepticism with respect to the question of life after death for Hume. He doesn't come right out and say, no, it's an impossibility, but he is much more skeptical, not only concerning life after death, but all other allied religious topics than Locke himself is. He's famously skeptical about the existence of God, about, you know, judgments and afterlife and, and all of that stuff. So if he can't say very much about the afterlife, given his theory of knowledge, given his philosophical methodology, what can he say about this life? What can he say about the good to be pursued in this life? Well, he says quite a bit. Um, and in a way, what's remarkable and more revolutionary about Hume's thought, even than the, the specific things he, he says, is the way that he, he goes about evaluating the questions. 
Hume is really uh, among the very first um, people that you would think of as a kind of empirical descriptive psychologist. He's, he's a, a keen student of uh, human behavior and human motivation. And so when it comes to his ethics and later on to his politics, he thinks that uh, virtually all of the extant moral theories, whether secular, whether grounded in reason, whether religiously informed or what have you, are off the mark because they're in conflict with, they contrast with uh, what we can observe concerning human behavior and in our own lives on a day-to-day -day basis. So consider those who are the sort of rational moralists who think that morality is grounded somehow in reason, in, in our own rational nature. Well, uh, on the one hand, uh, Hume rightly complains that the rational moralists had not taken into account the degree to which affection, sympathy, sentiment, and moral feeling drive and should drive our own moral conduct. In addition to that, uh, Hume thinks that Reason doesn't and can't enter into um, ethical judgments and decision making in the ways that the rational moralists had thought that it could. In particular, reason's use in the moral life for Hume is strictly instrumental. That is, the job of reason is to figure out the, the best, the most prudent, the most expedient ways to achieve your goals, right? To, to, to acquire that which you value. But, but reason itself cannot tell you what is of ultimate value. Reason itself is directed towards the means of acquiring ends. It's not directed towards the ends themselves. So what your ultimate end or goal in human life is, is something that can't be established by reason, but it is something that, is, that emanates from the passions. And so he memorably, famously says that reason is and should be the slave of the passions, which just turns Plato completely on its head. He also does battle against Hobbes and those who are of a more uh, rational, self-interested bent. Remember, they're not trying to establish very thick, contentful moral principles or claims and say that these things are grounded in reason. Um, rather, all of the uh, ethical directives and the prescriptions for social organization flow from this kind of enlightened self-interestedness, this impetus to self-preservation. Like Rousseau, but I think with more eloquence and more power, he points out the fact that this simply doesn't take into account our own personal experience with respect to the way that we feel and sympathize naturally with others. You know, in many cases, we, uh, we do things that aren't designed to benefit us. We, we actually do things because we care about the other for the sake of the other. We care about the other as such and not simply instrumentally with respect to the way that the good of the other might boomerang back and, and redound upon me, benefit me in some way. Um, with respect to the social virtues as well of benevolence and of justice, when we see justice, when we see benevolence writ large and we see effective sympathy in the individual case, we are drawn towards it. We find ourselves approving of it and wanting to emulate it in ourselves as well as to, to see and applaud it in other people as well. This doesn't have a rational grounding, but nor does it need one. We are animals, we are creatures of habit, led much more by feeling and uh, habit than we're inclined to think that we are, since we tend to think of ourselves as being driven by left brain rationality alone. Hume sees us in a quite different light than that. He sees us as being um, governed by certain sets of psychological laws in which the affections, the heart, and the heartfelt dispositions have a primary motivating and justificatory role.